1458 BC. A rebel warlord challenges the might of Egypt. The two greatest armies the ancient world has ever seen are ready to fight. The fate of Egypt lies in the hands of its young pharaoh, who has never before seen battle. If the rebels win, Egyptian civilization will crumble. This is a true story. The chronicle of this epic struggle was carved into the stone walls of the Temple of Karnak over three and a half thousand years ago. It records how a pampered prince was transformed by war and turned his kingdom into an empire. He became Egypt's greatest warrior pharaoh, Tuthmosis III. For a generation, Egypt's three million people have lived in peace and prosperity. Most are farmers and fishermen, living along the fertile banks of the River Nile. Akmosi is a peasant farmer whose family worked this land together. Their life follows the changing seasons. Egyptians marry young. Akhmose's wife is just 16. They expect that one day their children will take over from them and work the fields. But Akmose's life is about to change. The sacred ibis are an omen of danger. miles away in the capital Thebes, Queen Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh, is dead. While the country mourns, Egypt's enemies are gathering. Prince of Kadesh, an embittered Syrian warlord, is whipping up revolt among the tribes of the north. For decades, they have struggled under the yoke of Egypt and her imperial ambitions. With 150 mutinous princes behind him, Kadesh plans to invade Egypt and crush the power of the pharaohs. Egypt is vulnerable. What she needs now is a leader of unswerving courage and tested military skill. But the new pharaoh is Tuthmosis III. For 20 years, this princeling has been kept from power by his stepmother, Queen Hatshepsut. 
He has been pampered and indulged, untroubled by the affairs of state. But now he is a king with a nation to lead. To the Egyptians, he's a living god, his body a sacred object. But to his enemies, he's simply a young king with no experience of battle and a feeble hold on power. Tuthmosis comes from a long line of warriors. A century and a half ago, the founders of his dynasty expelled the ancestors of the Prince of Kadesh from northern Egypt. Syrians and Egyptians have struggled for supremacy ever since. But none of Tuthmosis's ancestors ever faced a military challenge as great as the one that confronts him now. Three and a half thousand years later, this is modern Luxor and the ruins of Tuthmosis's temple of Karnak. In a narrow passageway, on a wall few visitors will ever notice. There's a long inscription in Egyptian hieroglyphs, carved on the orders of Tuthmosis himself. It tells the story of his war against the Syrians, which begins in the winter of 1458 BC. Just weeks after taking the throne, Tuthmosis and his entourage moved from Thebes to the fortress of Jaru, 500 miles north. Jaru is on the Syrian border. It's Egypt's largest garrison and the gateway to the Middle East. The young Tuthmosis locks himself away with his generals. Jehuti and Jamanej are hardened soldiers, skeptical of the young pharaoh's ability to lead. They have just a few weeks to devise a strategy to defend Egypt's borders. Recording every word of their deliberations is a fourth man, not a soldier, but a scribe, named Jineni. He's been called the world's first war correspondent, and it's his words in ancient Egyptian that are carved into the temple wall at Karnak. The Prince of Kadesh and his allies have gathered at the city of Megiddo, near present-day Jerusalem. Megiddo is now the nerve center of the revolt. Kadesh has persuaded the northern warlords to provide him with every fighting man they have. Under his command is the largest Syrian army ever assembled. He's determined that this time, Egypt will fall. Oh, 
مولاي الامير قديس كاين في ماجيدو ماجيدو نعم مولاي صار The intelligence is worse than Tuthmosis expects, far worse. Megiddo is just 150 miles from Egypt's borders, and Tuthmosis is heavily outnumbered. He needs more men. Conscription is nothing new in Egypt. For centuries, peasants have been taken from the land to build canals, temples, and pyramids. But Akhmosi is destined for something different. The army. Akmose knows he may never see his wife and home again. The eye of the hawk god Horus is a magic charm that wards off danger. Every Egyptian is now touched by the threat to the kingdom. <laughs> Akmose is just one of thousands of young men herded north to possible death in the struggle against the Syrians. In February 1458 BC, Akmose and his fellow conscripts reached the fortress of Jaru. The pharaoh is mustering every fighting man in the kingdom to throw against the Syrian rebels who plan to invade Egypt. Akmose is a peasant farmer who has never left his village before. He is now going to be made part of the most sophisticated army the world has ever seen. Quartermasters marshal food, weapons, and clothing supplies. Every day, an army of 10,000 men consumes 14 tons of grain and 95,000 liters of water. The wealth of Egypt pours into the war effort. What makes the Egyptian army so formidable is these men. An elite corps of professional soldiers, Nubians from the south in what is today Sudan. Nacht joined the pharaoh's army three years ago, along with five men from his village. His ambition is to rise through the ranks, and he is likely to succeed. Nubians are admired by the Egyptians for their courage, strength, and skills in combat.
For men like Nacht, the coming war is an opportunity. There's booty to be had and glory to be won. Other Nubians have become generals and risen to the top of Egyptian society. The most Ahmosi can hope for is to get back to his home alive. Raw recruits must be made part of the military machine. This is the job of Egypt's officer class. Yamunej and Jehuti are two of the pharaoh's most trusted generals. They come from very different backgrounds. Jehuti is an aristocrat. Yamunej rose through the ranks. Officers will be equipped with the latest military technology. Ivory-tipped arrows, bows made of imported birch or elm, bound with glue made from fish bladders. As well as the most radical innovation of all, the chariot. A lightweight war machine that brings speed and surprise to the battlefield. The lower ranks will use more basic weaponry, axes, knives and spears. <laughs> Nacht is putting the new recruits through their paces. Wrestling is the Egyptians' favorite sport, and in the army, it's a useful test of manhood. Mose has made the grade. And the Pharaoh's army is in fighting spirit. By April, the Prince of Kadesh is preparing to move the coalition's 10,000 men from Megiddo towards the Egyptian border. Tuthmosis, the inexperienced leader, has grown in confidence. He won't wait for the Syrians to invade. He won't fight a defensive war.
he will invade Syria and crush the rebels at Megiddo. The army will march tomorrow. This momentous decision is recorded by Jeneni in his chronicle, inscribed on the walls of the Temple of Karnak. But to reach Megiddo, the army faces a grueling march of 200 miles across the deserts of Sinai and Gaza. Jeneni the scribe is part of the campaign. He's here to record the Pharaoh's exploits and guarantee Tuthmosis a place in history. Jeneni is not interested in the hardships of foot soldiers, such as Achmose and Nacht. But this thousand-year-old papyrus, discovered in a tomb in Luxor, tells us what life was like for the ordinary soldier on campaign in Syria. At first, the army makes rapid progress. In the first 10 days, it covers 150 miles. Then the heat takes its toll. The pace slows from 15 miles a day to five. Three weeks later, and the troops have crossed the Gaza Strip and the hills of Canaan. They're camped deep inside Syrian territory at Yacham, in present-day Israel. The soldiers are exhausted, and their thoughts turn towards home. Mose, like every Egyptian, is terrified of dying outside his native land. If he's buried in foreign soil, without his family to tend his grave, he'll have no chance of reaching the afterlife. If he dies here, his spirit will be cast into oblivion and he'll face a second death. And perhaps Tuthmosis, despite his status as a god, is troubled by the very same thought. He's just 30 miles from Megiddo and the rebel army. And now he must make a decision. The choice he makes will dictate his future and the fate of Egypt. The young pharaoh now faces the most important decision of his campaign. Jeneni recalls the discussion with his generals. For the first time in his account, 
we hear Tuthmosis' own words as he spoke them 3,500 years ago. Surprise is the key. Reach Megiddo quickly, catch the Syrians unawares, and they could crush the rebellion in a single strike. From their camp at Yahan, there are three routes to Megiddo. Through Yoknayam, north of Mount Carmel. South, through Tanakh, approaching Megiddo from the southeast. These are the safest routes, but also the longest. There is a third approach, the Aruna Pass, a narrow gorge that snakes through the mountains. It's the most direct and the most dangerous. For hours on end, the army would be exposed to ambush. They'll take the Aruna Pass. The generals think the young pharaoh is wrong. Jeneni records their words. Sumi Ach, Shamat Hemetian Ben Intiwo El Hamas. You to her smith a Jew, her who emo aha her ebor. In your Tahieta, emo er haha, you na en pechwe ah, Aria em em arona. Onik nae, Merwe ra, Hesuti yoti amun, you watch a heme, her men chempe, aruna. Emisha, and she lives in Moche. Herna and Magian, Joda Joy, Meg, Cousin in Nahirwe Boudra, in New Hemeth, where Jaherki Magian, UFA, a sinage nun, Cousin. Oin in Pak and Sanabe. Amoy in him, O Medjan. Nahat, a Juanjan, Nam Tahat. Yamachi. But has Tuthmosis signed the army's death warrant? On the 14th of May, Tuthmosis leads his army into the Aruna Pass. <laughs> 10,000 men must march in single file through the narrow gorge, utterly exposed. For 12 hours, they are open to attack from above. Oh, 
But the Syrian ambush never comes. Kadesh has been outwitted. He expected to ambush the Egyptians on the southern route to Megiddo. Now his troops are in the wrong place. All he can do is scramble back to Megiddo. Six hours later, Tuthmosis is within sight of the Syrian stronghold. Tomorrow, for the first time, Tuthmosis will lead his men into battle. Here at Karnak is Jineni's eyewitness account of the final minutes before the Battle of Megiddo. It's the 15th of May, 1458 BC. <laughs> Tuthmosis anoints his peasant soldiers with sacred perfume to bring down the gods' blessings on them in battle. The real test has come. Jineni describes the Egyptian positions. Hadesh too is ready. Egyptians and Syrians face each other at last.
Assyrian bodies drop around him, Kadesh's dreams of conquest evaporate. All Kadesh can do is save his own skin. The Egyptians have victory within their grasp, but they let it slip through their fingers. Instead of attacking the city, they loot the bodies of their Syrian enemies. It's the common soldier's chance to enrich himself, but it's a military disaster. Jeneni's account condemns the foot soldiers for their greed. The Egyptians measure their success by collecting severed hands. But this is not yet a victory. أنت شوف سمع يا واحد جوج لب يا جاي يا نيا يبرم لب شوف أحمد ما يتو ما يدل has the greed of the foot soldiers been the Egyptians' undoing? The pharaoh's generals are in disgrace. It was their job to take Megiddo. Instead, they stood by while their own soldiers plundered. Tuthmosis will now have to starve the Syrians into submission. No one knows how many Egyptians fell at the Battle of Megiddo. The Egyptian military documents keep quiet on the subject of their own casualties. What we do know is how Egyptian surgeons treated the wounded. This papyrus is the world's oldest medical textbook. 
It gives detailed descriptions of treatments for battle injuries. Raw meat, with its natural blood clotting agents, is used on flesh wounds. Burns are treated with a mixture of gum, ram's hair, and the milk of a breastfeeding woman. But despite the doctor's best efforts, most of the wounded in this field hospital will die from infection within days. Another ancient text sums up the fate of many Egyptian soldiers. Tutu hertit, bisa erwau, bimoneh ermiga, bisheru tutu herschabrif ernahme umkani unmautif, sabrif erurami iokasnu poshwash. Ahmose, ahmose. For seven months, Tuthmosis holds Megiddo under siege. Finally, in December 1458 BC, a symbol of surrender. These are the children of the Syrian warlords, offered to Tuthmosis in a gesture of submission. The Syrian revolt is over. The children will be taken to Egypt as hostages and killed if their families rebel again. Some are destined to become puppet rulers within Tuthmosis's new Egyptian empire. Moses returns to his capital, Thebes, in triumph. No one doubts his strength now.
ستين هيخين تويرو اسين تابوي حمف اتبه حتاو خيسوسان اني اخو بشف انو روباو عمون اخان سونين ازت اورو نم هيخو حمف خيار انو سين امهات نبو سيسي مفكات اسيسي روكيت من امهات اوات نتميت جاني حمف واتكت اموس الخيار انو امخانت The final words of Jineni's chronicle are those of the defeated enemy, the Prince of Kadesh. Over the next 20 years, the Pharaoh Tuthmosis III fought and won another 17 campaigns. At the time of his death and mummification in 1425 BC, he had imposed Egyptian rule across an empire that extended, he claimed, as far as the circuit of the sun. Jineni's eyewitness account of the Battle of Megiddo set a standard of military heroism for every pharaoh who followed. As Tuthmosis intended, he is still remembered today as Egypt's greatest warrior pharaoh. Ancient Egyptians continues at the same time next Thursday. Details coming up. For adults or children, these highly illustrated titles are available in the shops now. To order, call 0870 1234 344 or click onto channel4.com slash shop. V. Graham Norton is V. Close. In fact, it's next.